the Intel Core i5-2500K was easily the most popular processor of its time. Alongside the 2600K, Sandy Bridge has been able to hold strong through several generations of Intel processors, and AMD's next big architecture launch is only just now occurring. Zen should be here in February, and KB Lake has already arrived, so now seems like a good time to finally start considering upgrades from Sandy Bridge, and that's what we're testing today. Before getting to that, this coverage is brought to you by Thermaltake and their Core P3 ATX case, which is wall-mountable and can act as an easy access test bench with high-quality materials. Learn more at the link in the description below. In this revisit of the i5-2500K Sandy Bridge processor, we'll be testing Sandy Bridge's staying power into 2017. We've got the 2600K on here, but we're focusing on the 2500K for today. This includes Blender rendering speed, so that would be a production, application, and workload, which is a bit more unique because there's some multi-threading advantage there. And we'll be looking at a handful of modern games, Watch Dogs 2, Battlefield 1, all of those, a couple of synthetic tests just to provide a baseline of numbers, and this testing is limited to performance. So we're looking at FPS and completion time for benchmarks, thermals, power, all of that stuff's been done for this processor and it hasn't changed, so we're not going to be revisiting it today. The 2500K shipped alongside the 60 series of chipsets, or the 6 series. So that would be things like Z68, if you remember that chipset and platform. But it was also compatible with Z77 motherboards, critically. And that's sort of still true today, where we have Z170 and Z270 have some intercompatibility, depending on which CPU you're looking at, for potential upgrade. The 2500K also has a base frequency of 3.3 gigahertz, and it turbos up to 3.7 gigahertz and it can fairly effortlessly overclock to 4.5 gigahertz or thereabouts with maybe a 1.3 voltage and you can tune plus or minus based on your particular processor with the right cooler. So it was a flexible CPU and now it's just important to see how it's held up. As for TDP and other specs, the CPU had the same TDP as modern Intel CPUs, though it's significantly less powerful and operates at a lower clock rate, which are hand in hand. The memory support on the 2500K was also limited and is somewhat critical to performance changes in some specific applications. The right motherboard went a long way in this regard. You could still run higher memory speeds, but still not anything like what we have today. And of course, there's a DDR3 versus DDR4 change as well. And in case anyone's forgotten, IO has changed a lot since 2011. So HSIO now consists of things like M2, NVMe, and a whole slew of devices that are enabled via the PCIe bus. And that's not really something that was that popular, or even in some cases like NVMe, didn't even exist when this CPU came out, especially not in consumer applications. So that's a big change and is something you should account for with upgrade plans because moving forward, even if the percent gains may be minimal in some use cases, the advantage from new IO devices could be a lot higher than just a raw CPU gain. And of course, PCIe Gen 3 is now everywhere, and USB 3, multiple generations of it, even Gen 1 and Gen 2, have pretty much proliferated the market. So the market's been shaken up a lot for I.O., and that's probably the biggest change here other than the usual clock rate. And because we're testing so many CPUs on different platforms, that means that we have multiple test benches to define. Those are all defined in the article linked in the description below, which also contains a few extra charts that won't be in this video. Check that link if you have any questions about what motherboard was used and what memory was used because we'll be changing between DDR3 and 4, of course, as we iterate through the CPU generations. And that's all defined in the article test methodology page. One more thing to note here before getting started, this is our addition of i5 CPUs to the CPU benchmark. This was promised in our i7-7700K review. Next will be to add i3s and the FX CPUs, each one of these sort of uh, core series updates does take a lot of work, so we're doing them incrementally. FX is soon, i3 is soon, and that is in preparation, of course, for Zen and for the i3 KB Lake CPUs that we'll be looking at shortly. The first test is our Blender benchmark that GN's Andrew Coleman made. The full methodology is on the site again, but the basics are that we're rendering a 4K image of these various monkey heads. Each monkey has different effects applied to it, all stressing the components in different ways. During GPU benchmarking, for instance, we noticed that the fur monkey stresses GPU memory in some ways that are not the same for CPUs. As the chart demonstrates, this is a benchmark where multi-threaded CPUs really shine. The additional threads are fully utilized for each 16 by 16 tile that we render. So two times the threads means two times the active in-flight tiles being rendered simultaneously. We already talked i7 numbers in the 7700K review, so we're focusing on the core i5 CPUs today. 
The Intel i5-2500K with its stock frequency settings is able to render our scene in 106 minutes, making it the slowest device on the bench by a long shot. The 3570K CPU, released about a year later in second quarter 2012, completes the frame in 94 minutes. A modern CPU, like last gen's i5-6600K, is able to complete that task in 73 minutes, and of course the 7600K is a bit faster than that. So we're looking at about a 30 minute faster render time over the 2500K, or a reduction of about 31% time required between the 2500K and the 6600K. If you're rendering using the CPU, as you might do if running both GPU and CPU on a render task, then the upgrade is clearly substantial and something that should have been done a long time ago. To provide some perspective for Sandy Bridge, the same gen i7-2600K is able to render the scene in about the same time as an i5-6600K, a multi-generational difference, at 74 minutes. If you bought an i7-2600K back in the day, you're still in pretty decent shape in this particular benchmark, at least compared to today's i5 CPUs. A trivial overclock to 4.5 GHz on the 2500K moves us up to an 82 minute render time, absolutely a worthwhile improvement. And if you're stuck on the CPU rendering things for a while, it's probably something that should be done. Let's move on to Cinebench synthetics. We're seeing the i5-2500K operate expectedly at the bottom of the bench. The 2500K is pushing single core performance at 124 CB marks with multi-core at 460 marks. The overclocked variant at 4.5 GHz, again pretty easy, performs ahead of the i5-3570K stock CPU and just under the i5-4690K in a single core and even in multi-core performance. 3 d Mark Firestrike is posting the i5-2500K at 13,498 total points, or 6,190 on physics, and that's the score we care the most about since it isolates the CPU and removes the GPU from the equation. The 3570K saw marginal improvements to 6,808, and the 2600K is pretty heavily improved in physics with its 9,033 score. As for what this means in practice, here's the 3 d Mark FPS output. We're seeing a physics FPS of 19.7 on the 2500K compared to 26 when overclocked. The i5-3570K and 4690K both fall between the stock and overclocked 2500K CPUs. There's some variance to testing with 3 d Mark, so keep that in mind, but these results are reliable nonetheless. There is just a bit of variance between tests. And that's all synthetic, of course, and there's only so far we can get with synthetics. We've got Time Spy benchmarks in the article linked below if you'd like to see more, but with newer APIs. But let's move on to FPS benchmarks for now. There are a lot of different ways to do game benchmarks for CPUs. So again, article below for the full methodology, but the basics are we've mixed in some CPU limited games and then a couple that would appear to be GPU limited once you reach the high end, but do show some pretty substantial changes as we approach the low end of CPUs where the GPU is now being bottlenecked by the CPU. So they're still worthwhile to test and provide a fuller picture of actual performance across various games rather than just a whole bunch of carefully picked CPU benchmarks. Starting with Watch Dogs 2, we can now reveal why we added this game to our CPU benchmarking workload. With the high-end i7 CPUs, we undoubtedly begin to battle with other system resources like the GPU, even though it's a GTX 1080 FTW in the system, and that means the differences between the Skylake and KB Lake i7 CPUs are harder to detect. As we scale down, though, the CPU choke becomes readily apparent. The 2500K is limiting our 1080 FTW to 59 FPS average when at 1080p with high settings, and that's a card which is capable of achieving, clearly, at least 2x that performance when using the latest i7 CPUs. If you're running a stock i5-2500K, this is about the maximum performance you can expect on our particular benchmark course. Frame time performance isn't exactly bad, it just scales linearly with the average. The 3570K shows a reasonable improvement, but even that gain is outdone by an overclock on the 2500K to 4.5 GHz. This isn't hard to do and can be held at around 1.3 volts, though your mileage may vary, and produces higher averages and 0.1% lows than the 3570K is capable of. More interestingly, we see the same Gen 2600K really stretch its legs in Watch Dogs 2, producing an additional 15 or so frames per second than the 2500K. This is where you get your value in those i7 purchases several years ago, better longevity mostly, and it's probably one of the most interesting stories here. We'll soon see if that carries over to other games though. With Watch Dogs 2, we're generally seeing that multi-core CPUs are advantaged, and the i5-4690K and 4790K i7 CPU have a sizable gap between them as well, furthering this point. But as for the 2500K versus modern CPU purchases, a linear upgrade would land you on the 7600 or 6600K, 
both of which produce an extra 20 FPS or so average frame rate throughput. Frame times improve in step with this, and Watch Dogs is a game where you could generally get by with the lower FPS, so the upgrade isn't necessary. You could be pretty happy at 40 to 45 FPS if not a stickler for hitting 60 all the time. But the point is that an upgrade would better allow for higher graphic settings. We're at high here, but moving to Ultra would be more acceptable with a higher end CPU. Battlefield 1 doesn't show as much change at the very high end where our 1080p Ultra settings are landing the KB Lake, Skylake, and Devil's Canyon i7 CPUs all roughly in the same performance range. Where we do see a change though is dropping down to the 2500K CPU. The 2500K still performs reasonably well in Battlefield 1 despite becoming a bottleneck to the 1080 FTW and is operating at 115 FPS average with the overclocked version at 124 FPS average. The 3570K performs about where the overclocked 2500K performs and the 4690K starts pulling away from the 2500 in a more dramatic fashion. The CPU is certainly slower but still keeps up pretty well in Battlefield 1. Only if you're pushing for higher refresh gameplay or upgrading into 1070 and 1080 class hardware will a bottleneck be really noticeable to a point of requiring a CPU upgrade. Unlike Watch Dogs 2, the difference between the i7-2600 and i5-2500K CPUs is not as substantial. Total War is new to our CPU bench and thus far only features i5 series CPUs. Before diving in, note that Total War does output frame rates with a good amount of variance, at the low end especially. This means we won't really be using the 0.1% metric as much since it fluctuates pass to pass and seems inconsistent overall. We're also only testing with DirectX 11 because DX12 has some issues, its performance just isn't as good as DX11, and so we're not testing it. We're seeing the 2500K perform at about 92 FPS with 1080p and high settings for this benchmark. Overclocking provides substantial gains, pushing us up to 114 FPS average with bolstered frame times. The performance improvement is about 24%, absolutely worth the overclock for sure. And looking to modern CPUs, the 6600K is capable of operating at 156 average, with the 7600K at 165 average. From the 2500K to the 7600K, we're seeing a stock clock rate difference totaling and resulting in 73 FPS average, or a percentage increase of about 80%. The final benchmark is GTA 5, and we had some confusing issues with this one that arose. I still want to include the benchmark because it's accurate for every other CPU except for two of them, and those are something, uh, they require some further investigation. Maybe someone out there has encountered this. But basically, with the 6600K and 7600K, we were seeing some stuttering that was not occurring on the other CPUs, making for slightly dragged down averages, but really heavily impacted 0.1% low values. Again, only on those two CPUs, the 66 and 7600K. When I tweeted out, we posted a tweet asking if anyone has seen this. A couple people responded. Jay from Jay's Two Cents said he saw something similar in the past with one of his CPUs. So it's definitely something that's known. Uh, we've done everything from reinstalling Windows to reinstalling GTA, drivers, XMP changes, all that stuff, and the issue persists. So. This seems to be less of an ordeal when dropping XMP, when turning off that profile and going down to something like 2133 megahertz, but it's still present. Still, we haven't got it fully figured out yet, but the benchmarks are still good for everything else. Those two CPUs have a bit of an asterisk next to them because of that performance anomaly. Right now, it looks like some sort of GTA issue when testing with our config. If anyone's got thoughts on this, post them below. So the charts, we're looking at an average FPS of 101 with the i5-2500K with overclocking pushing us to an impressive 124 FPS average. Compared to the i7-2600K, there's not a lot of advantage in GTA 5 from the extra threads, and we're seeing frequency seems to provide the biggest impact to performance, at least for the most part. The i5-3570K operates about 11 FPS faster than the stock i5-2500K, and then again, the other i5s, the 6600 and 7600K, just seem to have some issues, but are definitely at least 123 to 129 FPS in the averages. We've done due diligence on these to try and figure out that issue with those two CPUs. Again, Windows reinstall, completely fresh platform, drivers, uh, CPU changes, XMP changes, overclocks and not overclocks to check the memory bus or a memory uh, controller speed rather. Lots of things to try, but didn't quite figure those two out. So. Uh, that's the way it goes sometimes. For Ashes of the Singularity and Metro Last Light, if you want to see those results, check the link for the full article in the description below, as always, and that'll contain additional benchmarks and some further analysis. The 2500K has held up relatively well for the past five years, but it's starting to show some serious age in a few specific games. 
Watch Dogs 2, for one, posts fairly sizable differences between modern CPUs on the 2500K, though multi-core seems to matter more for that particular title. We're also seeing big gains from overclocking in a lot of games, especially because the 2500K was so easy to overclock. If you've got one, it might be worth throwing it under a good cooler, maybe an AIO, and pushing it for 4.5 gigahertz for the remainder of its life. Blender and rendering tasks are particularly abusive to the i5-2500K, which is being outpaced nearly twofold by modern successors. It's a good time to upgrade from the 2500K. The CPU has held on really well, as has the 2600K, and it's still hanging on, but it is kind of nearing the end of life where modern GPUs, if you're buying one, might get bottlenecked by the i5, particularly if you're going for anything above 1060 and 480 class, like the 1070 and 1080, and whatever Vega may bring. So that means it is now good to look for KB Lake and Zen. Now, normally we don't really recommend waiting for CPU or GPU or really just component upgrades in general, because unless there's something really specific you want, a lot of the time uh, it's just waiting for the sake of waiting because you can wait forever in the computer hardware world. There's always something new. But Zen is very close at this point. It should be launching next month, and that's close enough to wait, especially when you've already had the CPU for five years or so. And also, Zen, now normally, if a new Intel CPU were coming out next month, I might suggest not waiting, just because we know their gains are pretty small on average. Generally, if you need a system now, it's worth buying. Zen is a big deal for AMD. They haven't released anything major for several years now, almost since this CPU came out, the 2500K. So it's worth waiting around if you can to see how it goes. We'll revisit the topic when we review the Ryzen CPUs. For now, it's either a 7600K or 6600K if you can find one for cheaper than the KB Lake alternatives because basically the same, uh, but if they're used or something and you can get it cheaper, go for it. But uh, a 4690K might also be worth looking into if you can find one for cheap on Newegg Amazon or somewhere they're dumping a bunch of them to, to make room on the shelves. But that's all I got for you. So 2500K, pretty interesting results, especially in Watch Dogs 2. Subscribe for more. As always, Patreon link in the post-roll video. Links in the description below for more information. I'll see you all next time.